Association of the European University Association. I am very ha happy to welcome you all to our webinar. As you see, and some of you know our webinar, it looks a bit differently than in other situations. We are here at the Freie Universität in Brussels, where we just had for two days a focus group on research ethics and research integrity. So I'm very happy to welcome you to a webinar where we will address this issue for one hour and also share some insights and some experience we have had in the last two days here in Brussels. First of all, and before I start to talk or uh, to present the program, as many of you know, this webinar is recorded and it will also be made available online. You also have seen the chat function. So we will have at the end also a, a question and answer session. So please feel free already start whenever you want to write your question and then we will address them uh, after the presentations. So thank you very much. I'm very happy to start uh, after now the pres uh, to start the presentation with Yves Dumont. He is from uh, the European Commission of the Ethics and Research Integrity Sector of the Directorate General for Research and Innovation. And he will speak about the European Commission's ongoing efforts to build a common European reference framework for research ethics and research integrity. So he will speak about the actions being put in place concretely to improve the level of research integrity. I then will be happy to have Mar Maura Hine from the Health Research Board of Ireland. She will address the key elements for doctoral education that are included in the revised European Conduct Code of Conduct for Research Integrity, which means training, supervision and mentoring as part of building a, co a conducive research environment. Then we will uh, address the two days, as I told you, uh, spoke to you about the focus group we had. And I'm very happy to have Christian Dumpitak here with me at the university, who has been with us two days at uh, the focus group. He's a managing director of the IGRAD, Dr. Skund, Heinrich Heine University in Düsseldorf. And he will summarize the key findings of the last two days and also then discuss it with you. We will then have a question and answer session. And as I said, please feel free to write your questions and we will address them properly. So this is uh, from me now. So now I'm really happy to have Yves Dumont who will start to present on building a common European re reference framework for research ethics and integrity. Thank you very much. To everybody, um, the, the political attention to research integrity uh, at European level is um, still quite recent. Um, it started with the launch of uh, the current framework program, H 2020, which for the first time is explicitly uh, mentioning the term. In the rules for uh, participation, um, in the section about uh, the conditions for funding, it reads, uh, action should be in conformity with any illegal obligation, as well as ethical principles which include avoiding any breach of research integrity. So here uh, it's important to note that there is a very strong relationship established by the regulation uh, between ethics and integrity, and this relationship indeed prevails throughout the whole uh, legal framework of our uh, funding instruments. The um, policy on, on integrity is seen at the European level as, as a win-win policy since it, it is in the interest of all actors, of all stakeholders to, the, uh, to adhere to the highest uh, level of integrity. If we take a scientific community, it's of, of course obvious, not only because integrity is uh, a key element of, of research excellence, but also because it is uh, absolutely necessary to maintain or, or to promote the thrust that society has, has in science. For the founders uh, and the government more largely, uh, misconduct can lead to substantial waste of public money, reducing, uh, in, in any case, the rate on uh, research investment 
and it is, is a threat globally to, to citizens' well-being and, and public goods. Um, it doesn't only impact the, the research budget, but do also impact potentially and sometimes very clearly other budgets for the reason that research results are used in policy making. So the relationship between scientific advice is, is misconduct should not be uh, undermined. For private actors and industrial actors, misconduct can lead to um, deterioration of their reputation with a direct impact, as we know, on, on the stock exchange value. And for society as, as a whole, uh, well, there is of course the, the, the tax per year perspective, but also more globally for future generation and the environment, ensuring high level of integrity is, is, is the way forward. Um, why tackling this at the European level? Well, the, the problem itself is common uh, in most of its element to the, the, the countries, a member of the Union. There is also a risk of ethics uh, and integrity dumping, uh, exporting you know, negative practices to countries inside or outside Europe that would be more favorable. So globally, uh, tackling the problem at the level of the member states is, is, is more efficient. The, the two uh, axes, the two pillars of action are first to try uh, promoting adherence to the highest standard by making, for example, uh, it a condition for funding, adherence to uh, codes, and increasing awareness uh, via education as you will discuss it. The second pillar being the um, trying to make the system evolve, the system for uh, in adapting the, the, the careers, the performance evaluation, and this means going beyond impact, impact factors, citation index, and the current way uh, of uh, assessing uh, global performance of individual researchers, but also of research institutions. This means valorizing other elements in the career paths and in, in the way a research institution are, are perceived in, in their excellence and quality. Uh, this is uh, work on reproducing existing results as an example or participating to continuous peer review or training uh, students. The action of uh, the Commission itself is has been mainly driven uh, also by, not only by the new uh, regulation and provision of H2020, but, but by the first ever Council conclusions adopted in uh, 1st of December 2015 on research integrity. And here I will pretty much summarize the, the message which says that research excellence and, and socio-economic relevance are what we can expect uh, from uh, research integrity, the foundation of high quality research and the prerequisite for achieving excellence in research and innovation in Europe and beyond. And the uh, Council conclusion are calling for the fostering of an institutional culture uh, of research integrity, uh, mainly through uh, really clear institutional rules, procedures and guidelines, as well as, again, training and mentoring. Um, on the basis of these conclusions, the Commission has uh, taken four main actions. The first one that will be presented by the next speaker, Mora, is that we have initiated the revision of the European Code of Conduct on Research Integrity. The second was to beef up the provision, the legal provision, and in particular in the ground, the Article 34 has been adapted substantially by clarifying the principles and, and the main practices that needs concretely to be respected by anyone signing a grant in the context of H2020. The cooperation, reinforcing the cooperation between the national and integrity bodies is, 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 is another key. Uh, and the last one is the direct funding uh, of research on, on research integrity uh, via the Science Wisdom for Society program. Um, the new code of conduct, I will not touch it, except that for us, it, 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 it is seen as a way to promoting uh, this common reference framework in Europe that, that we expect, and we are very happy that the new text is uh, uh, condensed, streamlined, uh, uh, very clear, and could uh, be then directly referenced uh, very recently, that will be the case in the ground agreement, as the, um, the must, the obligation, the, the text to be followed. Um, otherwise, 
uh, I think that with the minutes that I still have, uh, I, I will simply list uh, the different uh, projects that we are funding that are relating to, to integrity. Uh, this started with the work program 2014 and 15 of the uh, Science with and World Society program. And the first project to start was Printager uh, in autumn uh, 2015. Uh, Printegr uh, stands for promoting integrity as an integral dimension of excellence in research and this is summarizing pretty much the objective of the project that will perform a systematic review of the state of the art, analyze challenges and drivers and develop uh, tools, uh, educational tools being uh, the focus and formulate policy recommendation. Another project, Deform, is on estimating the costs uh, of research misconduct and its socio-economic benefits and that will in particular develop a financial model uh, uh, about the related uh, risk of research malpractices and the loss of opportunity. Also coming up at the end with some uh, methodological recommendation on how to anticipate, uh, prevent and, and mitigate research misconduct. Um, the trust project that I would like to mention even though it's not focusing essentially on research integrity but is about reducing the risk of apex dumping as we coined it which is to reduce the, the, the likely exploitation of non-ethical uh, practices in uh, third countries via the cooperation with uh, bodies in, inside and outside uh, Europe. The networking is promoted via another project which is called ENERI that started in September 2016, which is uh, the European Ethics and Research Integrity Network that will have uh, many uh, common uh, actions between two existing networks, the one on, one on integrity and one on ethics, ENRIO and UREC, to perform benchmarking, joint workshop, um, brokerage events, but also uh, with a strong focus on developing training courses and uh, uh, material. The project um, entire is tasked and started in May 2017 because of the complexity of the legal environment to map uh, the existing integrity normative framework to help those who need it not only to uh, take opinion on research projects that are submitted to, to, to them in ethics committee or in integrity uh, committees. Uh, we have also a project on the ethics of emerging technologies, one is uh, Siena, and because new technologies uh, means new challenges and also new challenges for how to behave, uh, how to keep high standards of integrity. The uh, project um, that has not been uh, adopted but that is currently evaluated is aimed at promoting integrity in scientific advice in non-medical field. As I mentioned, uh, the use of scientific information in policy making is key and this project, this ambition project is tasked to see if it's coming up to come up uh, with uh, a Oviedo Convention or an LCK type of declaration for the non-medical research field. The last uh, project uh, that I would like to mention and on which I, I, I will conclude is a project I think that will be of your direct interest which is on the concept train the trainers and that is a direct response of the consent conclusion or request that the at the European level to have something uh, done uh, on, on, on this aspect that will of course improve the knowledge uh, of the trainer uh, but also create a database of uh, existing uh, materials so that it is uh, more, more accessible. The final note will be on the type of subjects that will most likely be touched upon in 2018 and 2020 that is supporting institutional changes in promoting integrity and the last one being innovative method in education and training. And I will conclude on this. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yves Dumont. Uh, we are going to have a question and answer session later. Maybe it's one small question from Jordi, if you could tell me, us, is there a place where we can find an overview of all this project you have mentioned on the website? Or? Uh, well, there is not one page on, on which this project will be all uh, described, but we, we are happy to, to circulate the, the, the names to, to you so that you can make the, the audience profit of it.
Okay, thank you very much. So now we are good. I think we have an audio. Okay. Yes. Um, so we will look now after for these links. Now I would recommend that we go on with the um, with the next presentation of Mora Hine from the Health Research Board of Ireland. Could you? On. Second, please. Yes. Hello. Yes, How are wonderful. you? Hello. Yes. Uh, welcome. So we are. You are on the screen, and we are looking forward for your presentation. Great. Thank you very much. So I was asked to look at the code of conduct, the European code of conduct, and how it might help with thinking about the development of training courses. Uh, so what? Very good. So what I want to cover really, first and foremost, is uh, the, the meaning and scope of research integrity within the Code of Conduct, uh, some of the drivers for the both the revision of and the, and the understanding that there is a need for training in this area, um, how the European Code of Conduct could be a basis, and just some very, uh, one very quick slide on research misconduct and unacceptable practices. So, in terms of the uh, meaning of research integrity, its scope, uh, it, within the code it is seen as covering the entire research process. So right from the beginning in the design of the project, but also uh, the uh, acquisition of ethical approval if that's needed, uh, through the actual doing of the work, which includes methodology, performance and analysis, and then to the dissemination. And that can be either a scientific publication or indeed it could be public discourse. So research integrity covers the entire process and the code reflects that. Uh, the reasons why there are so is such an emphasis on research integrity and why the conversation is so um, alive, I suppose, is that there is a now a realization that traditional reliance on self-regulation really is no long, longer appropriate. And um, there have been many publications uh, to to demonstrate this, and you know there were some, there was a, a a recent publication talking in about about the rise in retractions, but not just that 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 a lot of these retractions are due to misconduct. So there's clearly a problem that needs to be addressed. There is also a, 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 an evolving interest uh, by the European Commission and also by others in Europe around open science and the whole open science agenda, including open access to research open publication, research integrity, and so on and so forth, uh, has become very important. But of course, there are some unintended consequences which are now also starting to be explored in this area and could be interesting from a teaching perspective. And as I say, open access is a really key pillar for the Commission and for others. And it will also require some fairly significant challenges around uh, training researchers in data curation and management. In terms of reproducibility, I mean, you know, we're, we're all hearing now about the reproducibility crisis, about why most publications are false, um, and especially in the clinical area, why we cannot, or it is very difficult to trust clinical data anymore. So I think that, uh, you know, everybody is getting very interested in how we can improve the reproducibility of our research and its excellence and research integrity and training in this area is a really important step in that direction. Um, and the, of course, one of the issues that's been identified is that it is the importance of training and mentorship is recognized, but it's also understood that it's very patchy, patchy and in variable quality. And therefore, I think it's very important that initiatives like the CUA webinar is, are trying to, uh, I suppose, get people to think on the same lines in terms of developing their codes or their training. And the European Code of Conduct is it's not the only one, but it's a very good starting for training because what it does do is it recognizes that there have been some very substantial changes in the funding environment uh, since 2010. And these are technological. I mean, people now can publish on, on um, open publishing platforms. People are blogging. Uh, the way data is stored and managed has changed hugely have changed since 2010 in a way that might not have been anticipated then. We are thinking about new metrics all the time, old metrics, um, and also just the ways in which people work, the ways in which people collaborate, and perhaps even the whole research culture has changed a great deal. So that is taken into account in the new code, 
Also, the, uh, in revising the code, we invited industry associations to the consultation sessions and invited written feedback from them. And because so much collaboration now is with industry, it's very important that the, uh, people can be comfortable that when they're providing training, that it's also going to be relevant if uh, their students or their researchers find themselves in industry settings. And I think what it really does is provides an international framework from which you as national and institutional developers of curricula can work to sort of uh, make sure that you've got everything covered, but also that you're not out of step with your colleagues elsewhere. So there is one section specifically on training, supervision and mentoring, which is new to the code in 2017. And it really places emphasis on training in research design methodology um, as a vital underpinning to good research practices. And this is something that was brought out by a very interesting paper recently by Johnny Onus, who talked about the need for people to understand better how to design their studies and what kind of methodologies are appropriate for them to use. It also signals the need for training in ethics as well as research integrity, both the theory and the practice. And there are many ways you can do that through online training modules, technically face-to-face, -face, blended modules, if at all possible. There are a lot of really nice models out there that you could look at. Um, but it doesn't just assign research training to or research integrity training to junior researchers. This is something that needs to happen to people at all stages of their career lifespan, from the very junior right up to the very senior. Because as we saw in the space of five years, so much had changed in the research environment and people need to keep up with that. And finally, it places a huge emphasis on the importance of mentoring. And you cannot underestimate the influence that senior researchers will have on their more junior colleagues. There are some new research procedures also picked out, and, and, you know, in addition to the ones that would be more familiar to people. But it, what it does do is it takes in, we want people to take into account the state of the art in the research. And this is really to reduce duplication and research weight. And many agencies are actually now asking for people to do some sort of systematic review of the literature when they're putting in their application. Um, it also flags the proper and conscientious use of research funds, because this is, in, in uh, many instances, public funding, and therefore the public are demanding increasingly transparency and accountability, and want to feel that there's good governance. And finally, um, the obligation to publish, which was not captured in the first code, is very much captured here, because again, we want to reduce waste and duplication and increase the quality of the research that people are doing. And this is especially important if you're looking in the clinical sphere, but it's important in all spheres of research. There are some new additions in terms of safeguards as well, because now I think if there's a much better understanding um, about the impacts of gender, age, ethnicity, cultural background, and so on, on the design and the analysis and the interpretation of research. So this isn't just about gender equality, this is literally about taking into account the impacts that somebody's age or their gender might have on the results of the research, especially in the clinical sphere. And of course, because of the open science agenda, data practices have now become important. And we, I think that people really need to think about training, curation and fair principles so that they know how to manage, preserve and make their data appropriately available. Finally, uh, publication. Again, you know, there have been a lot of changes in this area, but I mean, the whole idea of this is that you make your research available to your colleagues as quickly as possible. And that is very much an underpinner for the open science agenda. And um, so we've got, you know, open access publications has been on the go for many years, but it's improving. And in fact, many funding agencies now are trying to make this mandatory. Um, Unfortunately, with publication, you know, many of the difficulties around that are disputes and authorship. So who should be on, who should be off the paper, and in what order, and who should just simply be acknowledged. And there are some excellent guidelines that I'd really recommend you look at around COPE, uh, from COPE, uh, who have developed some lovely principles um, about rights to authorship. And I think that would be very interesting to include in a training program. Um, it's very important to promptly co uh, correct errors because what we want to do is make people uh, uh, willing and, and able to correct on those errors very quickly and take off incorrect data or conclusions. Uh, because I think at the moment people are afraid that if, they, if people see a paper has been retracted 
or correct it in, that it will some way um, reflect very badly on them and we w would like to change that culture at all possible. So that's something that could be built into training. And finally, the publication of negative results is just as important as the publication of positive results. And that is particularly important in the clinical area. And really, there's no excuse anymore not to publish these results. Um, it was a difficulty with the traditional journals, but with um, the advent of open publishing pl platforms like F1000, and I know the Commission are also working on a similar platform, there's really no excuse anymore not to publish negative results. So, just a very last slide, uh, unacceptable practices. I mean, obviously, if you don't adhere to the good research practices laid down in the Code of Conduct, you're you are already in breach of good practice. But there are some unacceptable uh, research practices that we have picked out, I suppose, which have become uh, more important. For example, um, the republication of substantial parts of people's um, previous work, because, of course, that's a way of bumping up your uh, number of publications. And I mean, we all appreciate that people are under huge pressure to publish. So really, it's very important that people aren't recycling uh, previous work just to pump up their publication record. Um, and I think uh, it's very important also that sponsors and funders don't try to uh, bias or influence the way in which uh, data is analysed. And that, I think a lot of people are afraid of that from uh, industry sponsorship, for example. Um, you know, people do all sorts of strange things, like they expand their bibliography uh, just to make themselves look better. Um, and also, it's important that if you see something wrong, that you should be willing to report it. That comes in itself uh, an unacceptable practice if you don't do that. But I mean, as I say, you know, it isn't possible to provide a list of all the unacceptable practices out there. But at least if you start by understanding what the good practices are, I think the unacceptable practices will become obvious very quickly. So I leave it at that and thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you very much for your presentation. I now would like to address uh, Christian Dumpitak, who has been now patiently also uh, close to me here. And you are going to talk about what we discussed in the last two days and what the major findings are. Please. Thank you. Uh, hello and welcome. And uh, I'd like to share some impressions uh, of uh, the uh, focus groups of the last one and a half day, which was full of very fruitful and, and stimulating discussions and exchange of, of uh, practice uh, all over. So I think um, what, uh, of course, uh, it, uh, summarizing this in 10 minutes is, uh, is hard work. So uh, therefore, we uh, have only the chance to, to just uh, scratch the surface. Um, generally, there we, we uh, experience the great diversity of different dynamics as well as of different approaches in the individual countries. So we had altogether uh, participants from uh, of 17 uh, higher educational institutions uh, who shared their practices, and it ranged really from uh, several years long experience. Uh, in giving trainings towards uh, individual doctoral researchers, but also to supervisors, to uh, uh, some institutions currently discussing the implementation of uh, those uh, um, 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 activities. So um, in general, there is not that clear one solution for everyone. So. Uh, how, which can tackle every complexity of an individual institution. Um, however, although there are different practices and implementation strategies, um, we also uh, experience that there's a common basis of, of research integrity and what we think is important, especially in doctoral education. So. Um, for example, uh, of course, no doubt, the, the, the major target groups are, of course, the doctoral researcher. And for all the participants, there was no doubt that research integrity is and must be a central issue in doctoral education uh, due to the fact that doctoral researchers are uh, professional researchers at their earliest career level. And they take over responsibilities throughout the next uh, career levels. 
Um, but nevertheless, also a, a, a general experience was that doctoral supervisors play a vital and fundamental role in the process, and especially those of our participants who experience, uh, have experiences in uh, handing over training uh, reported that uh, several doctoral researchers uh, suggested that their supervisors might also have the chance to uh, uh, participate in such courses on research integrity to, to uh, maintain a common uh, basis on the discussion. Um, in general, uh, all the participants, it seemed that they uh, um, agreed upon its uh, research integrity is about fostering a culture of taking care uh, that research integrity is an important issue of the scientific community and inside the institution. And it's about raising awareness and especially the involvement of all participating researchers in the institution. Um, yeah, the points are standing for several <laughs> issues uh, which would now uh, break the 10 minutes, most probably. Um, to give you some insights on what we discussed, for example, this uh, question whether uh, it, sh it is appropriate to make compulsory courses for doctoral researchers. Uh, we even had uh, from the colleagues of Denmark uh, the report that at some universities in Denmark there are compulsory courses for doctoral supervisors in research integrity as well. Um, there was a huge discussion what is more appropriate top-down or bottom-up approach, and uh, where is the, the, the institutional responsibility. So it looked a little bit like uh, both approaches have to be combined to get a real uh, institutional uh, approach towards research integrity. Um, then there was a, a discussion about what is the content of these type of courses. Is it about research integrity and how much, for example, should uh, research ethics or uh, theory of research, theory of science should be implemented in these type of courses? So there are also different experiences and uh, like with every solution there are benefits and uh, there are some challenges with every uh, uh, strategy. The question of how to adequately uh, address the target groups, especially at those institutions where there, there's a voluntary participation um, of the doctoral researchers was a, a big question. So um, some examples, there were uh, examples on uh, making a cartoon uh, a calendar or uh, using postcards to, to sensitize for those issues. Um, and it went up to even questions whether research integrity and participation in research integrity should become part of the evaluation of either research or even researchers. So no clear suggestions to that point and still an ongoing discussion. Um, I think last but not least, um, and I hope I'm still in the time, uh, um, uh, to, to, to just give you some, some uh, impression on how far uh, the discussion went, uh, a point which was is, uh, previously quite unestimated is the question, what do we do after a research misconduct has taken place and was investigated or, and maybe sanctioned? So is it possible that we establish also a culture to learn? Is it about uh, making everything perfect and fine and uh, mistakes are not allowed? So Generally, the participants said, no, it's not about uh, avoiding mistakes. Uh, research must learn from this. But the question is, is there an open culture so uh, to, to discuss from possible mistakes or what, what uh, bad experience did I as a researcher had in my ind individual life? So this is something which, uh, where you can also uh, come up with where are the dangers in everyday life uh, as one part of the open communication. And I hand over my Thank you very much, uh, Christian. So now we had uh, three very interesting presentations, which uh, gave a lot of food of thought. So now we are entering into the question and answer session. So I would like to ask you to write down your questions. I will read them and ask our presenters. <clears throat> now I have the first question of Garrett of Neil, who is uh, the president of Eurodoc. And Ask that there are several cases where early career researchers have made public uh, unethical behavior or research misconduct from senior researchers. And now the question is 
this could have very bad consequences for this uh, early career researcher. So the question is, how is it possible to prevent also whistleblower from possible very harmful or harmful consequences of reporting misconduct? And now this question, he did, I think it's whoever of you would like to answer this or address this, please. Um, can I, I, I'll start, yes. if that's okay, uh, Maura Heine. Um, I mean, I think you raise a, a very problematic element of uh, research integrity and protecting it because the, the history with whistleblowers has not been a good one. And you, you, you point out uh, some fairly horrific examples there, but, you know, um, I, I mean, I'm taking for your name that you're Irish. Whistleblowers in general don't end to do very well in the system. So I think, unfortunately, I don't think there is a silver bullet to uh, address this problem um, completely. It really needs to become something that is part of the culture. It's seen as a positive thing in developing a strong research environment. Um, I mean, there, uh, in Inari, which is a, a kind of a network of networks around Europe of search integrity and research ethics, networks and being funded by the Commission, uh, one of the work packages that it has is to try to develop some guidelines around protection of whistleblowers that people can use at a local level. I'm hoping that that will have some uh, impact because I think this issue is very much on the minds of anybody who's been developing codes or developing guidelines. Okay, Christian. Yeah, uh, regarding the, the question of Gareth and Neil, um, I, so there was a huge discussion about this this topic as well because there's there's a, a strict there's some hierarchy between early stage mm -hmm. career uh, researchers and senior PIs and supervisors. So and it's it's, it's constantly a question of whether there's a chance, as as, as Maura said, of implementing uh, a whistleblower protection inside the rules and regulations of this, uh, these institutions. So there are some countries who who already have uh, recommendations towards this. For example, Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft in Germany has uh, uh, in the revised version of their recommendations a, a, a chapter in implementing on a whistleblower paragraph. But it's uh, a question of implementing this and bringing this into life. But still there is this, this uh, hierarchy level and not for every uh, um, 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 case there will be the, 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 the balanced solution possible. Thank you very much. Now we have more questions. Uh, just to remember, remind you, if the question is for somebody explicitly, please also write it in the comment. But the next question is um, also from Louis Dunlop, where a postdoctoral student is found to have committed academic fraud. Should they actually be in included as a named author of any publication stemming from the research? I don't know if someone of you would like to answer this question. So, how do you, how would you deal with such a case? Mm. Um, well, I suppose for just wanting to check with Louise, are you talking about a publication stemming from results that have been found to be fraudulent, or simply that the person themselves? has been involved in, in some other instance of research misconduct. Um, you know, because on the one hand, we're talking about facing a retraction of the paper if the data itself is fraudulent in some way. On the other hand, what you're asking about is, is that a fair sanction for somebody that their name would be removed from publications uh, associated with their group, let's say, if they have been found to be uh, guilt of misconduct in perhaps a small sphere. So it, it very much depends on which way you're balancing your question. It's not quite clear. Um. So maybe we will have. Uh, oh yes. Uh, Louis asked the majority of data sound the fraud was committed at the end of the PhD. That's mm. the case she addresses. Yeah. I mean, that sounds more like a decision around whether or not that's an appropriate sanction. And I think that is something uh, that obviously is, is up to the investigative committee and the institution to decide. Mm -hmm. Because they'll know the details. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I have the next question from Claudia Dobrinsky. Learning from misconduct without academia means change management in traditional and old structures. That she says, do you have any successful experiences with that, with these kind of changements? I'm sorry, I can't see who is that question. Claudia Dobrinsky. Claudia. Um, so, so, so maybe uh, I start first from from what was discussed in, inside the, the focus group. Um, so we were looking who are the drivers of these processes, and 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 uh, definitely uh, um, there was some some slight agreement, or not slight. It was a major agreement of those who successfully uh, implemented the structures that there must be definitely uh, the drivers at the management level, at the central management level, who, who see this as an institutional uh, responsibility and uh, really bring this topic uh, to the fore. But next to this, you also need on the disciplinary setting, uh, multiplicators who bring this forward into the faculties, into the different subjects, into the different institutes, as well as people on the process area who bring the knowledge of the trainings, who, 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 who bring together uh, and, and, and manage the process, bring together all the network players. Because uh, altogether it's not a, a single approach. It needs to be, you, you need to take care that the supervisors ta uh, participate, you need to take care that, that uh, that um, the institution uh, uh, takes part, even up to libraries who can offer, and um, making this an, a typical topic to be communicated and discussed about, um, to, to change a culture. So this is not uh, something which you can only demand from, from one side. So several uh, stakeholders were identified who uh, uh, um, contribute to this process, to successful uh, processes. Yes, we have uh, more question. The next one is my colleague Lydia Borel Damian, who is Director for Research and Innovation at TUA. And she asks, within the pressure that doctoral candidates feel to publish their results, would the panel think that open science is more preventing or even fostering misconduct practices? Maybe, if do you have, what would you say? There was a mention of this kind of relationship in the council conclusion as well, and Nora knows it. And actually, it it, it worked both ways. Uh, this simply open science is is increasing the circulation of, of, of information and data, and, and enable easier access as well. So it means that it can be both useful in order to check and reproduce results. But of course, you can access more easily uh, raw, raw data that have been unpublished and, and, and decide, for example, to, to publish for, for yourself without uh, citing properly the, the sources. So it's, it's enabling uh, both type of, of, of behavior, positive and negative. You, you cannot, uh, in, in, in our view and in my personal view, uh, put the, 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 the cursor left or right. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think that it is, uh, I think overall, it is a force for good, the open science agenda, but there are some unintended consequences, which really were, I think, are only starting to be uh, explored and understood at the moment. Uh, for example, the emergence of predatory journals. Um, I mean, that is very much uh, a product of the open science agenda. Um, but I think overall, uh, people have been calling for transparency for years and open science is a fantastic way of uh, creating transparency so that you know more people can have a look at papers at the um, the results of the papers at the analysis the interpretation and so on so I think overall it can uh, it would be a discouragement for those who are thinking of uh, including fraudulent uh, or falsified data. But as I say, there are also some un unintended consequences, as with any, I suppose, new movement. OK. Now, uh, Jette Kuffert has a question for Maura. And she asks, you mentioned the need to teach not just research integrity, but also ethics. Do you have any examples of courses or teachings that address both integrity and ethics? Um, I think in most universities, now, I mean, and you will have to correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, research, because 
okay, they're, they're not in, entirely the same thing, research ethics and research integrity. So often research ethics and theory uh, underpinning ethics will be thought as a different course to research integrity, which is really about the doing of the research. So I suppose in some ways, if you think of the um, the ethical issues around are around the justification for the research in the first place, whether or not it is uh, properly designed, the um, moral uh, compass uh, that people use in approaching the research. Whereas I think if you look at research integrity and good practices, a lot of this is around how you actually do the research and how you report on the research. So I think both have to be thought, um, but I'm not sure it's particularly helpful for either to simply lump them in as the same course. Uh, that is my completely my personal opinion. Um, the EUA may have a, a different perspective on this. We want maybe also maybe just just because this this discussion also took place on on the focus group and we had uh, discussed several experiences for example at one university in norway the complete research integrity courses are giving uh, are given from or part part of it are given from the department for philosophy of science so in, in general you, uh, it, it came to the point it's a question on the uh, teaching objectives or the, the 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 learning objectives you have inside these type of courses so it's a question on, on, on the target group, whether there, there needs to be implemented uh, these, uh, whether there is already an awareness uh, implemented in, in basic study courses or whether this is an important aspect. Um, however, what uh, was a clear opinion by, by most of the, the, the participants was um, teaching values and virtues is different from teaching cognitive knowledge. So we are addressing effective teaching aims which does mean uh, that there, there is also an important uh, aspect about the attitude of the, the, the trainer, the teacher, and, and the person uh, transferring this. For example, in, in, in the area of life sciences and medicine, there's a high chance that some topics of uh, ethical implications are part of research integrity courses because participation of a, an ethics commission and so on is, is intrinsic part. So um, therefore, you, you, you has, there's also here, there's not the, 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 the silver bullet, it's, it's more a question of what is the purpose, who is the target groups, and uh, what is the objective of the institution giving this type of courses. Okay, thank you very much. Now we have a, a comment from Jean-Dominique Pollack, who writes that from his experience, thought at the end of the doctorate is linked to lose a supervision. Now, Lorena Montoya um, asks, or first agrees, that the culture of publishing only positive results creates a big bias. But the question is, how this culture can be changed? Is there any ideas? How can we actually change that, that people also not own uh, are good in publishing? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? It wasn't clear. Uh, okay. There is, I mean, she agrees that there is the culture of only publishing positive results and this leads to a certain bias. Now the question is, if we agree on that, what can be actually done that this changes? Well, I mean, I think uh, encouraging people to view all of their research uh, results, be they negative or positive, as equally important is, is, is the big cultural shift. Um, I think people have been driven to publish only the positive uh, through the attitudes of some of the traditional journals and so on because they want they want new, they want innovative, they want positive. Uh, negative results were very difficult to publish. But I don't think that that excuse can really be there anymore because the open publishing platforms will accept all research outputs, including negative. And in fact, there are journals now that specialize in the publication of negative results. And certainly in the clinical sphere, the publication of negative results is as important, if not more important in some cases, than the publication of positive results. Because you don't want people constantly trying to reinvent the wheel based on a lack of knowledge of, of work that has already been carried out and been found not to be very good, successful or good or negative. So I think, um, yes, it, it is a little bit of a change in mindset for the researchers, but I think there are more and more opportunities now for them to, for, to uh, publish the negative as well as the positive. 
I might I might add uh, to what uh, Maura said that indeed the the opportunity to to publish exists more and more. But that uh, at the institutional level, I mean, it should really be uh, clear to all those who are assessed that the, the publication in these uh, new uh, journals uh, are, are valued uh, as much as other publication. And I think that this is really not something that you, you write in, in, in your guidelines for assessment of researchers, but that should be spread out and, and discussed so that it is progressively integrated into the culture. And for institution to embark into uh, this shift, you, you need also to, get, to have a clear message from the founders uh, and, and, and from those attributing funds to institutions so that the evaluation of institutions uh, themselves are based on the same criteria. So it's, it's really the whole system that should progressively uh, uh, discuss this uh, new uh, evaluation criteria and, and make them uh, valued and, and, and that it is clear to everyone that we are serious about taking them into account. Okay, now we are. We don't have so much time left, but I still would try to ask now first the question also about the words we use. Usually, there's often this terminology of research integrity. Now, especially in the US, you have the term academic integrity, which is wider, and we have the question uh, why or what is the use here in Europe, and how do you address this? Should we also maybe broaden? The focus and not only speak about research integrity. Do you have here a quick answer to this question? Maybe uh, so. I, I, uh, academic integrity, as far as I understood the, the term in the, as it is used, uh, is used in the U.S., is more on the uh, daily academic life, including also uh, um, uh, pre-research degrees, for example. So, um, of course, you cannot separate this in, in, in the daily life of a university. So, so therefore, they, um, uh, even research integrity issues are interlinked with basic studies, and it, it's also interlinked with, with, with terms of supervision, So, which might be under the aspects of, of academic integrity. But um, I think there, there are so, so many terms, and the, the, the discussion of what is the meaning about this will have to be taking place where and whether there are clear borders or separations. Okay, now uh, we have to just actually very a short time left, so I have two questions. Uh, Garrett asked about this code of conduct that it's usually aimed, particularly aimed at academia, not industry. So the question is, do you think this code is also relevant for industry? And does it provide an, an adequate framework for academic industry collaboration regarding integrity? And Louis Dunlop just put on this comment and asked also if this should be extended to the clinical field for both public and privately funded hospitals. Uh, this is also not a particular question, but maybe Mora, do you have here yeah, some um, comment? Perhaps on, on Garrett's question first about the uh, applicability of the European Code of Conduct to industry. Uh, when we were revising the code, as part of the stakeholder consultation, we actually invited a, a number of industry representative associations to participate so that we wanted to ensure that they would be able to apply the European Code of Conduct in their own work. Um, and if you read the code, you'll see that when it comes to things like intellectual property, um, there are the, 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 the language is quite carefully uh, crafted so that industry can, in fact, come on board with this code. So it was very much in our minds when we were revising the code, and therefore it should be uh, something that could be applied in an industry academic uh, setting. I mean, of course, time will tell whether this is really the case. And this is why we, we will be revising it again in about three years' time, because obviously these things move on. Um, and sorry, there was... Uh, um, in terms of the clinical field, I mean, we weren't differentiating any particular discipline. And there are elements of the code which would uh, clearly need to be looked at. I mean, it's only a framework. So a framework um, is only going to get you so far. For specific disciplines, I think people will have to look at where the guidelines might have to be tweaked to suit their particular uh, concerns. And, you know, the clinical field or humanities 
or engineering or psychology or whatever, they will all have particular needs that they'll need to tease out for themselves. The code is simply a high level framework within which they can work. Any other comment? So I have now the last question from Michael Bassler, and he addresses that national research foundations such as the DFG stress the necessity to work accordingly to the star state of the art practice in this respective discipline. Good practice in art history might be different from in cell biology. And I think I would like to add this is not only uh, research practice, but also publication practices, for instance, and publications firms. Uh, the DFG calls this lege artis. But where are the discussion about the state of the art happening? Where should they be happening? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, well, it's, if, if you would ask me for my university and for my opinion, but, but I'm uh, representing a faculty of mathematics and natural sciences, I would assume that, uh, or I would suggest that these type of discussions regarding what is Lege Artist has to take place among the scientists in this specific field. So that, for me, it would be a question whether there is a room of uh, uh, maybe a, a, a peer counseling of doctoral researchers or in, in addition with, uh, L with, with, with mentors, whether the, this is part of the direct supervision process because they are the expert and you need experts to, to, uh, to uh, ensure uh, to maintain what is state of the art, uh, because sometimes state of the art is, which is, is uh, so frequently that 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 they, that you need an actual expert for on this specific field. So, um, but uh, the more people talk about this, and uh, if, if if there's a chance for a greater institution to uh, to generate uh, um, uh, ch chances for discussions and communications about this. Um, this would be great as well, from but this personal perspective. Okay. Any other comments? No. I, I mean, obviously, it, it it is something we called out in the code of conduct um, around establishing state of the art in grant applications, for example, and in the design of your research project. But I totally take your point that in different disciplines meaning of state of the art is going to be different. Um, in terms of discussion, um, there is some interesting discussion happening among the funding agencies around Europe. Uh, there is a, a, a group, it's a quite a, a loose group, uh, but looking at research waste. And of course, one of the things that has been identified in terms of research waste is that people are not always trying to find out what's been done already before they put in their application and you know the the funding agencies don't always have the time to check this up so i think that is it's it is also seen as a way not just of ensuring that something is based on best practice but also that it isn't wasteful or duplication duplicatory use of public funding so there is a little bit of discussion there but i don't think this is something that there has been a general and broad discussion about Okay, thank you very much. So first of all, I would like to thank very much to all the presenters, to Yves Dumont, to um, Maura Hine and Christian Dumpitak to, be, to have participated in this webinar, taking your time of your busy working day. So thank you very much and I learned really a lot and this can always be a start of a discussion and not the end. So we definitely will go on working together on these issues. So thank you very much. Now, thank you for inviting. Uh, thank you. Now, first of all, now I also would like to thank. Well, first I would like to thank my colleague Brecht, who is also our uh, policy officer here at uh, EUA, who has been very active in. And is now also in charge of the technique. You don't see him, but maybe you can say hello. Uh, and I thank you for most of all as participants to have uh, contributed with your question and taken one hour of this afternoon to be part. Now I'm very pleased and happy to present the next EUA webinar, which is about lessons learned from the thematic peer groups on learning and teaching. It will take place uh, 29th of November, also at 2 p.m. And you see now the slide with the website, so you will get more information uh, and we are looking forward
to have you all. So I think tomorrow the subscription will open so you can already start then again. And as you say, this webinar will be made available. There was also the question about information about the different projects we talked about. Of course, we'll, you will get some information. So it's just for me to thank you very much and wishing you a wonderful afternoon. And I'm looking forward for the next webinar and also to know many of you in one of our events of the CBE. So thank you very much.